What is the younger Dryas? Okay, so what is the younger Dryas? It sounds like somebody's name, right? Oh, Mr. Younger Dryas. And I actually used to think it was two last names of like two scientists who figured it out. What it is, the Younger Dryas is a period of time, about a thousand years long, that it's the very, very end of the Ice Age, right? The Ice Age that we also call the Pleistocene. It's called the Younger Dryas because the name Dryas is basically the name of a little flower and pollen from that flower was found at that temporal level. And that flower tends to grow in slightly colder conditions. So when the scientists found it, they thought it was a little weird. And so dating reveals that this thousand years of time was a little cold snap right at the end of the ice age. So what happened about 15,000 years ago, the ice age starts to warm up. Right, and we start to get towards modern temperatures. It starts to get there and then boom, pretty quickly it goes back down and stays again at ice age temperatures for about another thousand years. And then the trend goes again and then we come towards modern day temperatures. The end of the younger driest period is the line between the Pleistocene, which is the ice age, and the Holocene which is modern uh, environmental conditions, right? Dates wise, we're looking at about 12,900 to 11,700 years ago. If you want to do the BC AD thing, eh, about 11,000 to 10,000 BC, give or take plus or minus. So in terms of did this happen or not, the evidence is really, really good. We can tell through like ice core samples and this kind of thing that things indeed on Earth had a little tiny cold snap at around that time period. But why did it happen and what are the implications? <laughs> that part is a lot harder. I will say that the evidence really points to the Northern Hemisphere being more affected by the Younger Dryas than the Southern Hemisphere. So it's interesting to note that when you have these climatic changes on Earth, this can happen where certain areas of the Earth are much more affected than other areas. Like, for example, during the Younger Dryas, in a place like Greenland, you're gonna see a real dip in temperatures, maybe as much as 20 degrees Fahrenheit uh, at certain times in terms of what it was like during the Younger Dryas versus now, like a really big difference. But if you're like at the equator, you might not notice anything at all, like a degree or two or something like that. And I've seen that when I look at other uh, sort of environmental shift times, if it's like the Little Ice Age or the medieval climatic event or the Altithermal, these are all different uh, environmental trends that, that we see throughout time. And they're like that, right? Oh, this area on the earth is pretty severe. In this area, not so much. I think we also even see this in modern global warming, right? We know for sure that the earth is getting hotter. We know for sure that it's our own use of fossil fuels, but the effect globally depends. Some areas it ain't so bad. Other areas it's really extreme. So we see that kind of thing with the Younger Dryas. What else goes with the Younger Dryas? We also have the death of a lot of the megafauna. These are the big ice age creatures like your woolly mammoths and this kind of stuff. A lot of them die off during this period, but they don't all die off. Some die off before the Younger Dryas, some die off after, right? So saying that the Younger Dryas like caused all of the death of the Pleistocene mammals that's way too overstated. I don't think the Younger Dryas was that big of a deal in terms of that. Um, what you also hear is the comet impact theory that uh, a comet hits the earth in the area of Greenland and 
affects Earth's temperature and the Younger Dryas is because of this uh, hit of the comet or comet debris, you know, hitting this part of the Earth. And I will say that there is really good evidence for a comet impact. Just think of like a, you know, meteor. Basically, big stone falls down and hits the Earth or broken pieces of the st stone come down and hit the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. Don't think of this though as like the comet that destroyed the dinosaurs and that kind of thing. This is not on the same level. And based on what you see globally, I think you could say that if the comet uh, actually dates to the Younger Dryas time period, which people argue back and forth a bit about, um, that it probably did factor into the Younger Dryas or some of the stuff that goes into it a little bit in the Northern Hemisphere only. You know what I mean? So don't think of it as like, boom, comet hits, worldwide event, all the megafauna are dead. That's not really what the data is showing us. What is not the most satisfying thing about science is that we have all this data and it doesn't all point to a certain day on Tuesday when it got cold and a bunch of stuff died, right? It depends. It's more refined, depends on where you are on the earth. And again, when we look at this, the real answer as to what caused the Younger Dryas, it's not just a comet. There are several different theories as to why. One of the bigger ones is that ocean circulation changed at that time. And what I mean is there are ocean currents that start at the equator and go towards the Northern Hemisphere, right? In the Atlantic Ocean, I believe it's called like the Atlantic Conveyor Belt, bringing warm water up and that's gonna warm the Northern part of the planet some, right? If you stop that, things are gonna get a little colder. So it really seems that that flow stopped somehow or was like curtailed somehow and that is the number one best guess as to why the Younger Dryas happened. Or could it be just the ocean water and have nothing to do with the comet? Absolutely. So when we see these different factors that may have added to the Younger Dryas, the answer is often yes to all, <laughs> which is kind of a bummer because again, we can't focus in on just one aspect. It's a bit of everything.